you know, engineers, we actually have such high risk in terms of the world because we're literally designing the worlds that we live in. And so when we're not designing an inclusive world, half the population is having to really adapt and work so much harder to just do the basics. Hello, I'm Sue Nelson and welcome to the Create the Future podcast, brought to you by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, celebrating engineering visionaries and inspiring creative minds. Nadia Musaji is an engineer who thinks big. In 2017, several years after being named one of the top 20 young power women in Africa by Forbes magazine, she launched the One Million Girls in STEM programme. It was part of Women in Engineering, or WOMENG, a non-profit social enterprise she co-founded across several countries to encourage more girls and women into engineering. And, as we'll hear later, it's been incredibly successful. Nadia, who is also a serial entrepreneur, studied civil engineering at the University of Cape Town and did a master's in transport engineering. So my first question was about how her career began. I used to say by complete accident, but now I feel like it was probably divine intervention. I grew up uh, during apartheid, right, where access for people of color to universities was limited. And so, you know, my mom didn't finish school because they were at school during the 1976 riots where high school students were protesting against learning Afrikaans language. And uh, my dad also, you know, finished school and, and he went on to, you know, work his way up in a retail environment. And so they never had the opportunities to go to university, to go and become engineers. So I actually don't know, you know, I didn't know anybody who was an engineer. Um, I didn't know what this was. And, and literally it was Google that helped me make this career choice. I said, you know, I mean, I like geography and I like learning about, you know, volcanic eruptions and all sorts of tectonic plates. What career path is that? And I put in people who like geography, what do they do? Google sped out, become a geologist. And I said to my mom, you know, I'm going to become a geologist. And she said, you can't become a geologist because geologists work down in the mines. And so that's not a career choice for a girl. And so I went back to Google and I said, OK, what's a somebody who likes geography, not a geologist, but, you know, like a geologist, but not in the mines. And something called geotechnical engineering is, is what Google found for me which was in the Department of Civil Engineering. And so, you know, I, I, I learned a lot about it online and I said, okay, that's it. I'm going to become a civil engineer. Your mum, though, must have seen that you had a lot of the skills then to be in a, some sort of STEM field, be it the maths or the sciences, or, or, or were you practically very good? Were you always building things at home? I mean, not really. Um I was always the human rights defender at home and and, the, and actually the gender rights defender at home. I, I one day, you know, and I was kind of little and I said to my dad, I feel that it's completely unfair that boys get to wash the car and girls have to do the dishes in my house because dishes are an everyday thing and cars are once a week thing. And so it's kind of an unequal distribution of, of labor. <laughs> <laughs> and then my, my dad then changed the rules in the house to say that, you know, girls and boys both do the dishes and my brother has been upset with me ever since. <laughs> yes, I've always railed about that as well. I absolutely agree with you there. And it's interesting how, in a way, your mum was both an enabler of this freedom of thinking and feminist thinking to think beyond traditional careers at the time, particularly from her generation of what women should be. And you did this master's in transport engineering. So what made you switch from stationary constructions to sort of thinking about transport engineering? In, in South Africa, our degrees are holistic. So we do all kinds of engineering, not just structural. Um, so civil engineers are generalists in, in South Africa. And there were two things. I really loved the professor who was she was one of my few female professors at university. And so I, I chose that component. But then I, I also think about, I really love the idea of, of enabling people to 
be the best that they can be. And if you don't have transport, um, you don't have access. And I mean, I would even argue in, in our constitution, access to education and water and sanitation and housing and, and access to basic human rights, access re- requires transport. And when you don't have that transport, you have gross inequality and you actually you, you start to see that kind of degradation in society. And so now when I look back on it, um, you know, I think that, you know, as a transport engineer, we have such an impactful role that we can play in society to be able to kind of bring in the forgotten who live in the peripheries into our cities to be able to fully participate in in the economy. Was your first job then when you finished your education? I mean, you also got an MBA from from Edinburgh, so you can start to see immediately how this sort of how you ended up doing what you're doing with this variety of skills, both in engineering and business, leading towards being an entrepreneur. Was Arcus Gibb your first job? Was that how you got to work on the 2010 World Cup? Yes, and I guess it was such a glorious time to become a, a graduate engineer because, you know, South Africa had been awarded the 2010 World Cup. I went to work for um, Arcus Gibb, they now call Gibb, as a junior transport engineer. And I had an absolutely phenomenal senior engineer who was my mentor. I absolutely love Andrew. And Andrew, you, you know, took me under his wing and, and really taught me the trade, you know, and gave me all the kind of insider info. And then when the World Cup operations rolled in, I applied for a job and Andrew actually became the, he, he left Gibb to, to run the, via, the, the entire transport operation for Cape Town. At the time, I always say I had that split career because I was working as a junior engineer, but I also had my the nonprofit WomEng. Uh, I'd been working and, and growing WomEng on the side. And with WomEng, we'd worked with dignitaries. We'd worked with um, all sorts of interesting and wonderful people. And Andrew said, Nadia, we need somebody who can both understand the transport needs, but also understand how to deal with kind of very important people and dignities, etc. And so there was a VIP transport operator role within the FIFA team. And he was like, I think you'd be perfect for it. And so he literally took me with him when he when he joined the FIFA local organizing committee. And, you know, that was, it was such an interesting transition because it was kind of event logistics, but it was transport engineering. But I got to deal with so many, I had to deal with security and I had to do with presidential protection services and all sorts of characters. And I think it was the hardest job that I'd had at the time because it was, you know, you were on your feet for probably 16, 18 hours a day. And I had very little sleep for about the month of the World Cup when it ran. But it was the most exciting thing that a 20-something-year-old engineer could do. It's, uh, it sounds like you learned a skill that's valuable in so many professions, not just engineering, which is people skills, because you're always, as engineers, with people. You're always working with clients and you don't always see eye to eye maybe, or they might suggest something that you think, so you have to learn to be quite tactful which obviously you you nailed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think my, I think I always think about this, right? I feel like more engineers need to get into government um, and to become politicians. Um, and and I loathe to say this. And, do, and 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 the reason being is that we actually need a better quality politician in my country. And I I can't speak for the rest of the world, but, you know, just looking at global politics, I really do think a lot more engineers need to get in and navigate the space because a lot of our projects as engineers is politically driven, right? So, you know, the government decides that they're going to go on a massive infrastructure boost and they then decide what gets rolled out and on what the priorities are. And then engineers become, you know, implementers and advisors, right? And sometimes you start to see a, a massive waste of resources when infrastructure projects are not designed in the way in which it can benefit all, right? Because a lot of it is politically motivated. And I always think about, um, you know, we've been running programs to support girls uh, to get into engineering, and we work with university students. We were running a program in the U.S., and I made a political joke during the program. And one of the feedback we got was, you know, please keep politics out of engineering. And I said, the fundamental thing that people don't understand is that engineering is usually political. And the fact that we are not driving the conversation means that the wrong people are driving the conversation. We need to have better skills in this area. And so, yeah, that's my new push to try and get more people into, into places of power and positions where we can actually make positive change. 
And what sort of issues can come up if engineering designs haven't taken 50% of the population into account? I always use this example. You know, when we design public transport, we always design the most direct routes and, you know, the ones that are most efficient. But when you study behavior of people actually using public transport over time, you actually start to see gender disparities. So you'll see that men typically will take the most direct route, which is quick and efficient because that's how the engineers designed it. And women would take a much longer route to walk to to access the same services. And usually it's because it's the most wild route, lit route and it's the safer route, right? And so women are spending way much more time, energy and effort to access the same basic things that their male counterparts are accessing. And that's just because we haven't really thought about the user and from a gendered perspective, how women use infrastructure. They've done studies on accident rates and injuries during accidents on airbag deployment. And when airbags deploy, women and children get injured more than men do. And that's just because when they do crash tests, crash test dummies typically uh, on the average man and not on the average woman. And I think that's really important is, you know, engineers, we have, you know, we actually have such high risk in terms of the world because we're literally designing the world that we live in. And so when we're not designing an inclusive world, it means that half the population is having to really adapt and work so much harder to just do the basics. Yes, yes. There's a that marvellous book as well by Caroline Criado Perez, Yes, Invisible Women, which lists so many different aspects of of life and and some like the crash test dummies being potentially life-saving if only designers and engineers had considered that the male body or the male experience shouldn't be the default one because there's all kinds of difference in terms of height and body weight as well as like you've just explained. When did you decide to set up these organisations, the Women in Engineering and the WIM Hub? Sure. So, I mean, uh, women, we actually started while we were at university. And um, so I started it in my third year. It was actually born out of frustration and the worst that the engineering industry had to offer. Um, and so as young uh, engineering students, we all have to do vacation work at engineering companies. And so, you know, I went off, you know, very happily to go and do uh, my vacation work at a steel fabrication plant. And and two things happened there. So I was a young intern. I brought up the, the issue around pay and the owner of the company said, we don't pay our interns. And I said, OK, that's fine. I'll work for free because it's, you know, it's around the getting the, the knowledge. Um, and, and, and I had to do it. It was part of my, my degree requirements. I wouldn't be able to pass my degree without having the, the work experience. And so that was the first thing. And, uh, you know, so not getting paid and that was fine. And then when I was on the fabrication plant, I'm just a naturally happy person. I smile at everybody. I greet everybody. I feel like every person has, you know, a dignity and a respect that is associated with just being human being, right? And so we should just treat everybody like that. And so that's how I I usually used to go through life, just smiling and being happy with everybody. So on the fabrication plant, I was one of very, very few females in the plant. I think we were about three females on the factory floor. And then when I got back to university, university after my vacation work, two things happened to me. Um, The one was that I found out that the other interns at the same company all got paid. They all happened to be men. What? And and then I started getting emails from the construction foreman, the site foreman on the plant. And um, it started being, you know, very uh, flattering and, you know, trying to make advances. And, you know, I I shut it down because I wasn't interested. And then it started to become rude, aggressive, verbally abusive. I didn't tell anybody because he made it like it was my fault because I smiled at him and I apparently led him on through my smiling. And so I, the, the embarrassment and the shame and all of this around, I brought this on myself. You, you start to change your own behavior as a woman because you, you think that it's your fault, right? And so I, I never even told my parents. I was going to leave engineering um, and I was going to go and join, you know, a management consultancy or, you know, an, any other, you know, bank, you know, everybody wants engineers. And, and so they, they come to these recruitment drives at university. And then I started speaking to some of the female engineers in my class um, and in the faculty, and we all had similar stories. And so we realized that if we all left, nothing would change. 
And so we then started Womenj, and at the time it was called Essay Womenj because it was supposed to be like, you know, just for South African students and, you know, to support them around, you know, the challenges going into engineering and helping to actually get the, the, the industry on board around understanding the needs of women. And then the third kind of piece, you know, there that was, which was so interesting to me was we were living in a world and at a time where everybody said, oh, we need female engineers. We just can't find female engineers. But the majority of female in- engineers that I knew were struggling to find jobs. Um, and so there was a real mismatch there as well. And so we created this entire organization um, and we were kind of bold and, and bright eyed and bushy tailed. And we said, you know, um, and very naive <laughs> um, at the time. And we said, oh, no, we're going to do this for 10 years. And in 10 years, we're going to solve the gender challenges within engineering. <laughs> yes. Um, so very ex- exceptionally naive. And, and that's how women started. And over you know, the last few years, we've been building an entire ecosystem by both bringing young girls and creating awareness of engineering and engineering careers so that people make an active choice around engineering. We support university students around entrepreneurship, employability and innovation skills so that they can thrive in industry. We work with industry a lot around diversity, equity and inclusion and creating a, a re- imagining what an engineering culture could look like that is inclusive. And then the recession hit because engineering goes through ebbs and flows in terms of recessions. And so there we were, <laughs> you know, we had put, you know, all of this into this you know, organization and people were cutting our budgets, not because we weren't doing amazing work, but just there wasn't any, you know, engineering was struggling. And we said, well, you know, what we're doing is so important for the industry, but also for, to, to really shift the needle here and to create structural change, we can't just leave it as it is. And so we pivoted Women and we formed WomHub, which is a company, and we focused on kind of the revenue generation pieces of the organization. We started to become very business savvy, and uh, we started in consulting and advisory, and then we started building it out. And so you know, we, we've landed now at kind of being very much a boutique incubator to support female-led innovators in STEM. We've always been really first movers in terms of understanding the industry needs and then creating programmatic approaches to support diversity and inclusion, whether it's, you know, at a high school level, a primary school level, or an industry level, or within the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Because weirdly enough, the issues that entrepreneurs are facing, women entrepreneurs are facing, is what female engineers are, what we faced, you know, 15 years ago. Have you been successful in persuading companies to hire more women? Yes. You know, we've worked with some incredible companies who get this. And over the last, I would say, last two to three years, and and we've been pushing this narrative, you know, very clearly, um, especially with companies who have um, a consumer-facing brand to them, is that diversity and inclusion is not just a nice to have, it's not a tick box exercise, but actually it's an economic imperative. Because when you have a diverse team, you've got better solutions, you've got more effective solutions, you understand your market needs better, and so you're going to create higher profitability. And so we've gone in speaking to C-suite executives around using diversity and inclusion and hiring more women to make more money. Uh, And it's been interesting because, you know, for a long time we've used the, the... the narrative that you know we need to hire more women because it's the right thing to do we need the numbers in industry to reflect our population and that that argument has been you know we've been driving that argument and we didn't get as much traction but suddenly you talk about a bottom line to a company and you go hey you can make more money all you need to do is hire more women and suddenly they go okay fine show us where to hire more women from right and and we've been supporting companies in understanding how you know to roll out diversity equity and inclusion in in a way that speaks to you know values driven approach but also that we're able to bring in women into a a culture and environment that is welcoming. You're a member of the Global Future Council at the World Economic Forum. Are you seeing the percentages change worldwide? And are you seeing a mindset change? Because it's not just about, as you say, it's not just about tick boxes. It's about culture and worth, I suppose, as well. And, And women feeling appreciated. Within the World Economic Forum, they've driven the narrative around this fourth industrial revolution, which countries and, and governments have really taken up in, in a way that has been so interesting. Because I, I said to a colleague the other day, I said, if I had a dollar for every time a, a, a government representative mentioned 4IR or fourth industrial revolution, I'd be rich, I could retire. Um, and I could just start handing out cash to, to grassroots organizations to support STEM uh, for girls. 
But there's an understanding now that it's becoming an economic imperative at a country level to to make sure that your population has the right um, STEM skills. So beside beyond the World Economic Forum, I'm a co-chair for, I was a co-chair last year for the B20 Task Force uh, on the Future of Work and Education. You know, and it's, it provides policy papers for the G20 discussions and ratification. And, and this year I'm on the B24 of Italy. And STEM and women in STEM has become a priority like never before. Um, it's literally written into every policy piece to say, how do we enable women to get into STEM careers? So because we understand that STEM is a future skill. It's a current skill. We're living in a more virtual world or kind of this hybrid world of physical and virtual spaces. How do we make sure that we leave no woman behind in, in this new world? And then, you know, coupled with that is an understanding that we've taken a couple of steps back in terms of gender parity and equality based on, you know, COVID and and the implications it has had on women specifically. Yes, you're right, because there have been quite a few studies and reports saying that the um, percentage of job losses has been far greater on women than men, that more women have lost their jobs as the a result of the pandemic. So it sounds like you've got, you know, it's, it's a tough battle ahead. There's some really interesting studies that are coming out that showing that the number of women engineers in developing countries are rising. And But the minute they, they move into a developed country category, you actually have the number of women in, in you know, wanting to apply and study engineering falling. So, you know, the first time I went to the Middle East, I found it fascinating. I was actually in Iran in 2008, 2009 for a conference. And they had more female engineering students in their classes than men. And so Iran had the the opposite problem where they were having too many female engineers and not enough male engineers. And you started to see a lot in in Kuwait, in, in the Middle East, you start to see a lot more girls going to study engineering because it becomes a point of pride for a family that their daughter is an engineer. They're not necessarily working and practicing. And so that's, you know, whether they get jobs in the industry is a different discussion entirely. Um, and you're starting to see the same, you know, same thing in on the continent where if the child has an aptitude for maths and science, you know, the parents are pushing them into, you know, these industries because they want, they want to guarantee jobs and, and secure incomes. It's slow, though. And I mean, the work that we're doing at Women has been interesting to move the needles. I mean, when I started in engineering, my class was, we were 20% girls. Now the, the civil engineering classes are between 40 and 50%, right? So it does yeah. take time. This is a 15-year process. So my, my, my lofty 10-year vision, you know, it's just, it's just going to take much longer. And is this why you've partnered with the Royal Academy of Engineering's Africa Prize for Engineering and Innovation? That's exactly right. So WOMHUB, um, we, we had this vision to run a pan-African female founder accelerator for, for women in STEM businesses. And uh, we, we ran a number of projects with the Royal Academy of Engineering on building capacity for engineering institutions around diversity, equity and inclusion. And we've become, you know, trusted partners and allies in, in our you know, fight for, for gender uh, parity within the STEM industries. And the Academy, you know, they're running the Africa Prize for a number of years and they'd never had a female winner. And also the number of female applicants were really low. And so we approached them and they said, look, we've got this idea to run this Pan-African Female Founder Accelerator. Would you fund it? And the idea here would be we would then, you know, support these female businesses to apply for the Africa Prize. And we'd help strengthen the businesses. We'd help them grow. And in the first year, we had around 147 applications of female founders across the continent who had STEM businesses. And so that year, the Africa Prize, the number of female applicants obviously, you know, quadrupled. And in the in the 16 finalists for the Africa Prize, four finalists came out of the women's program. And the winner was announced as one of our fellows. So you're starting to see on the continent us being able to raise the profile of female entrepreneurs, helping them to support and leapfrog some of the gender challenges and the challenges for female entrepreneurs are access to capital. So we get 0.02% of venture capital compared to, you know, what Silicon Valley is getting. So, you know, female entrepreneurs. So, I mean, we're getting minute amount of money to be able to raise companies. Um, So there's a huge funding gap. 
we've done a lot of work around kind of sexual harassment in the entrepreneurship space. And every female founder has a Me Too story, you know, where they went in to go and raise capital and they were harassed in some way or they were asked to not just, you know, give equity in their company, but their bodies as well. So we're starting to kind of understand and speak around the dynamics that female founders face. Well, good luck with that. You've had some tremendous successes, but as you say, there are still still some challenges to overcome. But if there aren't people like you doing it, then that progress would be an awful lot slower. So thank you very much, Nadia Musaji, for joining me and explaining about your work on the Create the Future podcast. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Find out more about the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering by following QE Prize on Twitter and Instagram or visit qeprize.org. Thanks for listening and join me again next time.